Usually when Jesus told a parable, he would pull his disciples off to the side and explain it to them. He didn't do that this time. Why? What did the leaven represent? And what was meant by the three measures of meal? And who was the woman Jesus was speaking about? I want to know. Tonight, we're going to be studying the parable of the woman, the leaven, and the three measures of meal. It's going to be a profound revelation. And we want to begin our study with Matthew 13, 11. Well, let me read verses 10 and 11. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Now, this tells us something about the nature of parables and how we are to understand them and approach them. Parables are given in such a way intentionally by Christ that the person that is pure of heart will get the revelation. A mystery is something that is only unveiled through a revelation. These are mystery parables, we could call them, because it takes a revelation to understand them. The godly will understand those that are peripheral believers or whatever, they're not going to get it. And Christ did it that way intentionally. So we have to to look for the revelation. If we don't get the revelation, we won't get the parable. Now, in this text, we'll read it from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, and we'll begin with verse 10. And we're going to note where Jesus was at. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on Sabbath. Now, this is very important as everything in Scripture is important, because there's something that's different about this parable. Jesus did not interpret it. Other of the mystery parables, the parable of the tares and the wheat, for example, he took his disciples aside and he explained it to them. He didn't explain this one to them. The implication there being he was there in a synagogue his disciples were listening. He didn't interpret it. The implication is the meaning is so plain that the Jews that were in the synagogue and his disciples would have immediately understood just exactly what was being said. So we're looking for obvious in your face things that are blatant that are going to unlock this parable. And if we approach it with that understanding, we're going to come away from this, not wondering what it means or, well, maybe it means this, maybe it means that we're going to have the revelation. We're going to know we have it and we're going to perfectly understand it. And we're going to grab hold of a profound truth that is just so important as everything Christ taught. Now, Let's go down to verse 20, and let's read the two verses that speak of this parable. Luke 13, 20, and again he said, Whereunto shall I liken the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Now, there are three things, three symbols in this parable. And a parable is just basically a story that takes earthly examples like a farmer sowing seed or a woman putting leaven in meal to illustrate spiritual principles about the kingdom. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like this. So that's what we're looking at. Now there's these three symbols. 
We get the leaven, we get the woman, the three measures of meal. We're going to get this parable. And again, we keep in mind, these are things that would have been so obvious to the original listeners in the synagogue there that they would have needed no explanation. It would have immediately, they would have known the implication. Now, let's go to the book of Exodus. Let's get the leaven first. And this is easy. This is so easy and it's so plain that you can't miss it. And immediately, one of, we're coming into the Passover time, and every Jew knew about the leaven and the Passover. This was a part of their life. This was their biggest festival, the most important time to the Jews before the cross. And in Luke, or excuse me, Exodus 12, 15, seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day unto the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. Leaven meant sin. And we have so many people ask about, uh, do we really have to put uh, leaven out of our homes? And there are people that they turn their couches upside down and they worry about a pizza crumb in there and this type of thing. And many, and in, in the Orthodox Jewish community, in New York City especially, people spend thousands and thousands of dollars to meticulously clean their home, lest there be a little piece of leaven. For Orthodox Jews, this is the greatest time of depression, visits to the psychiatrist, and suicides because they're so paranoid that the leaven would be there. Now, last year, we did put the leaven out physically, and we said we're doing this as a symbolic act. Now, the thing of it we have to understand about Passover, we don't have to sacrifice a lamb anymore. We don't have to eat a lamb. You know, we, Jesus is the lamb that took away the sin of the world. The lamb, the leaven, all of these things are symbols that pointed to Christ down the cross. So that's the thing, getting out the leaven of sin. So just a little word on that, because this is something that people constantly ask about. Now, in uh, Exodus chapter 23 and verse 8, it was absolutely forbidden for any leaven to be offered with any blood sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. And in Exodus chapter 23, 18, thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, neither shall the fat of my sacrifice remain unto the morning. So this is really a no brainer. And this is continued in the teaching in the New Testament. Uh, the Apostle Paul interpreted the meaning of the leaven in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's begin with verse 6. And the text says here, Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So I think this is a slam dunk, Jimmy. Leaven is sin. Every Jew uh, the minute Christ said there's a woman putting leaven in something, they knew it was sin. Let's talk about the three measures of meal. This is also a slam dunk. Every um, Jew, let's, well, let's go to Genesis chapter 18. And in the theophany to Abraham, the father of the faithful, we have the first mention of the three measures of meal. And this is another thing every Jew was familiar with. In Genesis chapter 18 and verse 1, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, 
and he sat in the tent door in the key to the day. Now in verse six, and Abraham hastened unto the tent unto Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes upon the hearth. The three measures of meal was what Abraham prepared. And when the three men appeared, we know from the text, one of them, it says, was yod heh vav It was Christ in the flesh. And this three measures of meal is what Abraham prepared for these visitors. So the three measures of meal, of course, it, it represents the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, the bread of life, Christ himself, the bread of the word. It's the things of God and the kingdom of God in its totality in every aspect, the perfect representation by the three measures of meal. And in uh, another very interesting passage in, uh, in Second Kings, in one of the miracles of Elisha, we see a very profound spiritual significance of the meal in Second Kings chapter 4. And let's jump down to verse 40. It says, so they poured out for the men to eat, and it came to pass as they were eating of the pottage that they cried out and said, O thou man of God, there is death in the pot, and they could not eat thereof. But he said, then bring meal, and he cast it into the pot, and he said, pour out for the people that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. Elisha took the meal, threw it into the poison pot. It purified it. Yet you take the leaven, you throw it into the meal, and it will corrupt. The three measures of meal is a very pure and holy and powerful thing. Yet it must be protected because if the woman is allowed to put the leaven in, the whole will become leavened. Now let's talk about the woman. There's two women that we see in antithesis to one another all through scripture. We see the bride and we see the whore and we see these running through all of the word of God. Let's go to the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter six and verse two. And Israel was likened unto a woman. And there are many passages we could bring up. Jeremiah 6 and 2. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely, delicate, and delicate woman. Zion was represented as a woman. And this uh, goes all through scripture. We see of the wife and the bride. And also we see the harlot terminology, even before the cross. In, in the book of Proverbs, we see two women set in antithesis one to another. There is the strange woman, and then there is the woman wisdom in Proverbs chapter 8. And in Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 5, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger, which flattereth with her words. And in verse 10, she is called a harlot. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. So we have the bride and the whore if you will, in antithesis all through scripture. And of course, we know the scriptures in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, chapter 17 and verse 3, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, and right A couple chapters later in Revelation 19 and 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready. So it's pretty easy if uh, 
if the three measures of meal is the kingdom of God and there's a woman throwing leaven into it, it's not the bride doing that. It's the harlot. We have the harlot, the apostate church, apostate religion, and we're going to see, we're going to identify five specific kinds of leaven. And on the top of the list was the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And their very teaching was leaven that had to be avoided. So this is the perfect picture there. And they knew immediately the Pharisees were Christ's biggest enemies. And there in that synagogue, nobody needed to put an interpretation on this. Now, here's what we have a hard time coming to grips with. The last part of this verse that says, until, and let, let me read it to, to get it exactly. Let me go back to Luke chapter 13, and I want to read it to get it just exactly right. In 1321, it says, till the whole was leavened. Now, this tells us something there that we really don't want to believe and that we really don't want to grasp. But this is the revelation of this parable. There's a revelation here that's so plain that we don't have to miss it. But everything within us doesn't want to believe that all of the religious institutions of man are going to become corrupt. Now, we don't want to believe that. We want to believe that everyone except the one we're a part of. Now, the others... Yeah, they're corrupt, but not mine. And the whole is leavened. It's all going to go bad. This is what Jesus said. It's all going to go bad. Only the remnant that has the pure faith in Christ, that's all there is. And immediately when a person says, I'm a part of the NAR, or I'm a part of the Messianic movement. I'm in the Hebrew root. I'm in the word of faith. I'm in the Southern Baptist. I'm in the assembly of God. You immediately have identified yourself with a corrupted movement because it's all going to go bad. The only truth and purity they is, there is is in the doctrine of Christ following him and nothing else with Jesus as the head and you following. That is all there is. And we don't want to we don't want to go there in our thinking, but that's exactly the revelation of this parable. The whole is leaven. Yeah, I've ne- I've never heard I've never heard that taught like that ever. That's the fir- this is the first time I've heard this. Yeah. And I imagine it's going to be the first time that Many people have heard it this way. And you know how this is usually taught? Is that the leaven of the kingdom of God is going to make the kingdom of God grow until it just takes over the world. Now, that's not what's happening. Well, that's not, but that's not even what Revelation teaches. No, it's not. It's not. It's totally uh, it's totally out of whack. And, you know, we 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 don't want to believe that all of our favorite religious institutions are corrupted, but they obviously are. Yeah. They, Jesus said. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way and few there be that find it. That's why we're here saying Come back to Jesus. The The gate is narrow, but there's room for you. There's room for everyone that wants to go. But you see, you have to turn from corruption to purity. And the only purity there is is the doctrine of Christ. The whole has become leaven. And when we look at what we have around us, this is obviously the case that we're in. Now, this is in tune is like like you obviously said to say that the kingdom of God is just going to grow till it just takes over the whole world. 
I mean, that makes no sense at all. And that's basically <laughs> the old doctrine of post-tribulationalism. But, um, but Jesus said, or Paul said that, well, what is the scripture that says, and, and until there's a great falling away. Yeah. That doesn't sound <laughs> like the, the Christians love and, and everything taken over the world for Christ. It sounds like there's a falling away. Like it gets even smaller. Yeah. Let's look at that scripture you alluded to, 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3. And, um, you know, I could go into a Baptist church and I could preach on how apostate everything was becoming. They'd all say amen because they'd think it's all the other guys and not them. I could do it in a Pentecostal church. They'd shout, yeah, yeah. Because it's always the other guys. No, it's the whole is leaven. It's yeah. the whole thing. Uh, the messianic movement is not going to restore the truth of God to us. It ain't going to be the word of faith movement. It isn't, you know, people, I want to pick which movement I want to be a part of. Is this movement better than that movement? It's all leavened. The only purity and certainty is in Christ. And just like we, we said, there's a revelation here. The parables are mysteries. They're a revelation. And it's so obvious. If we just look at it, it's, it's, it needs no interpretation. But we don't want to accept this revelation because it just destroys our little paradigm of the world we live in. Yeah. But this is a big reality check. It's all gone bad. It's all gone bad. And this is exactly, as you said, the Apostle Paul, we'll just read a few texts from Paul, Second uh, Thessalonians 2 and 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day the return of Christ shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And that word falling away, apostasia, it means a defection and a rebellion from the truth of God. Hmm. It's right there. And let's look at 1 Timothy 4 and 1. And this isn't just the teaching of the Word of God in one place. It's the teaching in many, many places. Uh, 1 Timothy 4 and 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Apostle Paul has a very well-known and clear text describing what it would be like in the last days. I mean, any born-again believer with the Spirit of God in them, when this text is read, it jumps off the page at them. Second uh, Timothy chapter three, verse one, this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. And this applies to this whole apostate system. And as we look at this corrupted religious world that has all gone bad, the admonition of the Apostle Paul is from such turn away. But, you know, in America, and we've all done this, uh, when I got born again, I thought, well, I got to find a church to go to. This is what we naturally think. And, you know, today it's like, well, what movement is the best? Maybe it's the Hebrew root or, well, now maybe it's the word of faith or maybe it's the NAR uh, or maybe it's some denomination. You see, people are looking at picking their favorite corrupt system instead of following after Christ. 
Paul said, from such turn away. It's not truth. The truth of God is not up for a vote. God isn't grading on a scale. He is speaking to us through his son. And he calls upon us to believe, obey, and follow. Those, and that's so easy. We can all do that. But there's such a distraction. There's such a, a magnificent dog and pony show in the American religious world. So enticing. Multi-million dollar extravaganzas with all the talent, production, uh, all the beauty and grandeur. Uh, well, that you we, ever want to have. We need to be entertained. Yeah. I mean, Las Vegas doesn't have anything on these mega churches. I mean, they got it all, man. And, uh, but you know, it ain't there. It's not the thunder. It's in the still small voice and it's Jesus. Amen. And that's why we're here, Jimmy, to call people to follow Jesus. You know, it's all gone bad, but he never will go bad. Um, just follow after Jesus. Now, second Timothy three 13, it says in this text, and you know, well, may, me, you know, maybe I can join the Southern Baptist church and maybe I can fix it. I went through this phase too. And, uh, I thought, you know, I'll, I'll get in there and I'll tell them they'll listen. I'll fix it. Nah, that ain't how it works. Cause you see, Abraham did more for Sodom outside of it than Lot did inside of it. You know, we, uh, wow. we ain't going to help things going in and being part of a corrupt system. And is things going to get better? Second Timothy 3.13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It's not going to get better. There's going to be more deceivers that are themselves deceived. And you see, there's nothing more deceiving than a deceived deceiver because a deceived deceiver, they think they're right. And they seem so honest because they're deceived in what they're saying. Nothing more deceptive than a deceived deceiver. Yeah, they think they're right. I yeah. mean, they believe it. Yeah. And you've talked to Jehovah Witnesses. They're yeah. sincere. I have they're a dear sincerely wrong, but they're sincere. I have a dear friend who's a, who's a JW, and we can't even talk about it because it it starts with the Bible, because the Bible they read is doctored and false, and it's it's apostate. So, but they really believe it, and they're they work hard. They you know they're, they're good people, and it's it's um. It's been an eye-opening experience for me to to have this friend, but it's sad because I don't see only only God could can pull them out of it at this point. I mean, they're like you said, they're very sincere, and they're the, deceived. The same is true of Mormon missionaries. Yeah, those young men, very sincere, very dedicated, giving the of themselves more than the average believer would. Yeah. But they are sincerely wrong. So you see, being sincere, uh, Hitler was sincere. <laughs> he was deadly sincere about what he was doing. So you see, and being a nice guy, you know, um, I heard someone that was in a mainline denomination that was talking with, and uh, they said, yeah, I know this is wrong with my church and that. But my pastor's such a nice guy, such a nice guy. You see, every the, the Mormon gentleman that's the head of their church, he's got to be a nice guy or he couldn't keep the thing together. You know, all false teachers are nice guys. You know, yeah. they're all they're they're most. And of course, there's people that are just blatant deceivers. They know they're liars, but most of them are sincere and nice guys. Doesn't mean a thing, because just like Jesus said. The whole has gone bad. And that's the revelation we need to get a hold of. Yeah. And if we do, we're going to have a proper perspective for these last days. And if we don't, we're not. And this is such a biggie. 
You know, until a person settles this question in their mind, they're going to be trying to pick their favorite movement or pick their favorite denomination. And that's an endless road that goes to nowhere good. Well, if the hole is is full of leaven, I mean, what are people to do? Like, don't go to church at all? Uh, or just have home fellowships and just getting together with people and you just study the doctrine of Christ. I mean, what else can you do? Could we really do that? I mean, could we really just follow it's, him? It's too, and, it's too you know, simplistic. What did Jesus say to do? That's too easy. We can't do that. We, I mean, Jesus told them to go into the homes. But David, we we don't we got to have somebody with an education and a degree to lead us. I forgot about that. Yeah, I forgot about that part. I mean, we how are we supposed to read with, this from a cemetery, don't we? Yeah. How are we supposed to read this and know what it's saying? And and here's another right there you've hit on something that's one of the hugest misconceptions that the average believer of which I consider myself of all men, most average, that it's impossible to actually pick up the Bible and understand it. And all you see in here, I'm a teacher and I'll teach you how to be taught by God. All you have to do is pick up the gospels, read them and allow the Holy Spirit to bring to your remembrance what Christ said. And you can understand all things you see. That's what the anointing will do, according to First John. And that's how we understand the world we live in. Yeah. We have to know where we're at in history and exactly what we're doing. And if we don't understand this, we miss one of the most important parables Christ taught. Because if we understand that all of man's religious institutions have gone wrong, we can see the purity and the power of Christ and absolutely get together. Uh, the Bible said where two or three are gathered together in my name. He didn't say 20 or 30 or two or 300. And that's when the church had power. Jesus yeah. didn't build any buildings. He didn't tell the disciples to build any buildings. You don't see any of the 12 apostles saying, now we got to have a GoFundMe and uh, buy a pole barn. Uh, none of that stuff. It yeah. was up to the fourth century after the time of Constantine before any of that stuff started. Right. It was in the home. It was pure. It was powerful. They didn't need a million dollars a year to run their ministries, you see. And it's simplicity, the simplicity and the purity of Christ. And you get all the money involved. You get all the other stuff involved. It's gone south. A guy, it's obviously gone south. one of my clients, he's got this, the same concept you're saying. He's like, we just need people to get together in homes. The first thing we do, we take money out of the equation. Amen. Take money out, and now you, you there's that distraction is gone, and then or that whatever that that leaven is gone because you know, yeah, he, he, he there's people that are starting to feel this way. Oh yeah, and you know why? Because it's the truth. It is the truth. God will anoint the truth, and it's what Jesus said. And what will the truth do? Set it you free. Set you free. From what? From those corrupted religious systems to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you really don't have to pay your tithes. You really don't have to sow your seed. You really don't have to listen to the guilt put on you to give to the building fund. You don't have to do any of that. And it's not that God's people are not going to want to give to what's really right and proper and to help people. But if you stop giving to that apostate religion, you can start using the money God's blessed you with to really do something for it, for the kingdom. Yeah. You see, and yeah, we, you know, this is what the doctrine of Christ is all about. Jesus really is God. He really is truth. The Bible's really real. 
and we really can do what he said. It's just that simple. And you can actually be more blessed and do more good for the kingdom if you just read the Gospels, read any of your, your, your scriptures that you want, understand it in the light of Christ and the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance the things Christ said. And this is a huge one we're talking about right right today. And, and if you take this parable, and if you just do like we've done, unpack it, leaven, how can you make something good out of leaven? You can't in the Bible. And well, the woman, I wonder what woman it is. Maybe it's the bride. No, it's the whore. It ain't. Maybe it might be the bride. No, it's the whore. It's all about apostate religion, sowing things in to God's people, God's truth, God's word, God's kingdom, until every religious system of man becomes corrupt. Hmm. It ain't maybe that's what it means. No, that's exactly what it means. And this is a huge one. If you get this revelation it will change your life, the way you function, and it will set you right. It will set you working for the real kingdom instead of the false one. It will make well, you a part of the bride and not the whore. Well, check this out. So we have a friend that you and I have a friend who just recently got out of underneath that whole system. And they were talking about how now they how free they are to yeah now because something when you're in a church you are taught to um you come under your man of god in that church and you you you're kind of restricted if you want to say something maybe on facebook or something and and you're concerned because other people in your church follow you on Facebook and maybe it doesn't agree with something the pastor says so you don't <laughs> say it so you know so it's that freedom thing again it's like you know and and that's that's what she's telling telling us you know the freedom that she has now i'm giggling cuz that brings something back to my mind and years ago i can't even remember who the lady was but we went to a home Bible meeting. Someone had, someone invited us. So we went and this lady began to saying, I want everyone to know that we have permission from our pastor to do this. I said, thank God I wouldn't want to be at an illegal Bible meeting, you know? Uh, <laughs> but that's the, that's the thinking, you know, that's the thinking. And we're not starting another denomination here. You know, that is not what we're doing. I'm telling you that Jesus is the head of the church. He's the head of you, that you can obey him, that you can read your Bible, that you can worship, and then you can fellowship with people that are really making Jesus the head of the church. That's well, what we're doing. Well, two little stories from me. One, one time I was leading a Bible study at my house. And some people from the church I was attending started coming to it. Well, everybody was excited about it. And then, and then it kind of outgrew my little house here. And we wanted to start having it at, uh, in the church auditorium there, you know, on Tuesday nights, I think we were doing it and they were fine with that, but they wanted to go down to the bookstore and get a teaching series for me to follow that lined up with their their things. And I was, our whole thing we were doing was just going through the Sermon on the Mount. We were just reading the scriptures and talking about them. That's all we were doing. And they finally were like, they were okay with that. But I still had to kind of get their approval to use their building. But the same people were coming to my house, it was okay. But, but once we were going to be in that building, so that's, an, that's one story. But there's another story about another church in this area that I live in. And the pastor there won't allow members of his church to have home study things because, you know, he wants to control the message. And, and there was a lady who was having a Bible study and he found out about it and they asked her to quit. 
and she didn't, and she got kicked out of the church. Just getting in her house with people and reading the Bible, talking about it. So it does happen. It happens, and it happens a lot. And this control thing, um, and you know, we could do another lesson on this, but what illegitimate authority and control is, is witchcraft. That's what it is. And this is churchcraft. It's priestcraft. Call it what you will. It's not God. Churchcraft. uh, Yeah. And just uh, coined a new phrase. Yeah. And, um, it's, uh, you know, it's so easy. We follow Jesus. We do what he said, and we don't do what he didn't say to do. Jesus didn't. Well, we do. (laughs) Yeah. We're not supposed to. Go into homes. We'll do that. We'll not build buildings. You see, there was a definite pattern there, and and that's uh, uh, another whole lesson in itself. But could it even be that Jesus, in all of his wisdom, knows that when you build big buildings, it it takes the money that you could be using for something else, something better for people. And then even if you pay your building off, you got monthly expenses like crazy. You know, you, the, the now you really do need to be tithing because you got to keep the lights on and the AC on and the, and, and then pretty soon if your church isn't big enough, you don't have enough money to, feed the poor, uh, or to clothe anybody or do anything for anybody. You just gotta, you gotta pay the pastor's salary and keep the lights on, pay the mortgage to the church. And that's it. What else are you doing? What's the point? Yeah. It's, um, what can we say? Yeah. And you know, the things we are saying, they are so obviously true that it's, It's just true. In Luke 18 and 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Now, there's a rhetorical question Mm. here that has an implied answer. When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith faith on the earth? The implied answer, there's no. And this is in line with what Jesus said, that uh, there's a straight and narrow gate, few there be that find it. When I return, am I going to find faith on the earth? Very few. Well, let me ask you, this might be a stupid question, but what does that word faith mean in the context of this verse? Does it mean true followers, or does it just mean... um, people who actually have faith in God. I mean, a lot of people say they got faith. So what does it, what does faith mean right there in, in your opinion? Faith in Jesus, simple faith in Jesus, that he is the virgin born son of God, that he did leave us a great commission to teach the things that he taught and commanded and to preach the gospel, the simple faith in Christ. But all these people, these people in these churches we've been talking about would say they have that. Sure they do. So what's going to be the difference? Well, the difference will be decided and by judged by Christ himself. Thank God and not us. But how can, but how can we help? our brothers and sisters who are deceived right now. I think the best thing we can do is what we're doing. Just clearly teaching what Christ taught and say, turn to him. Yeah. I mean, that's the message. Turn to Jesus. And I don't mean a 75% turn or an 85% turn, turn all the way, you know, and Jesus said in another place, you can't put new um, new wine into old bottles. It'll pop them, you know. And what we're teaching right here, Jimmy, it won't fit in the wine skin of the local church denomination. It'll blow it up. Yeah. And they know that, 
And we know that. It's totally incompatible. Yeah. You'll you be asked to leave real quick. A guy that's got a million dollar piece of real estate and say Jesus said uh, not to do that and go into homes. You see, it's incompatible. They can't they can't tolerate what we're saying here. And that's why they killed Jesus, because the Jews knew that if people followed him, their system would be destroyed. And that's exactly uh, the position that we're in. And, and these weren't these weren't uh, Torah Jews. These were these were Kabbalah Jews by then. Right. Yeah. 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 By, Tal Talmudic is what I meant. Talmud. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, the confrontations of Christ with the Jews and the religious leaders, it's all through our Gospels. Yeah. It's, uh, it's all through there. And, and here's uh, another really great text for our study. In John chapter 12 and verse 24, this gives us the focus of their corruption. Who is the meal? that they're trying to corrupt in John chapter 12 and verse 24. Uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And when Jesus died, he brought forth the fruit of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost in the three measures of meal. He enabled believers to pray and come in to the Father's presence as our great high priest and intercessor. He sent back the Holy Ghost to abide in our hearts. The three measures of meal of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost came about when Jesus died. He is the three measures of meal that they're trying to corrupt. Mm -hmm. And if we get Jesus right, we purify that poison pot, you say, just like Elisha did. So mm. this is what we're doing. Yeah. That Jesus is God. What he said is really true. The Bible really is real. You really can trust it, and you really can just read it, understand it, and do what it says. Amen. That's that's it. It's uh and you see, it's so simple and profound, we stumble over it. But you see, when it's, it's a dangerous thing that when light comes to you and you reject it, the hardening process begins. And this is a dangerous lesson because it's hard for people to accept, but yet it's so obviously true that there's a danger in rejecting it. Because if you reject it, you're going to go headlong into something that you shouldn't have went headlong into. And that's just the way that it is. Yeah. Now, let's identify five specific leavens from the Word of God. There's five, and we're going to look at them. Okay. Uh, let's go to um, Matthew 16 and 6. And this would be the big one. Uh, well, they're all big. Matthew 16 and 6, Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So we got two leavens there, Pharisees and Sadducees. And in 1611, it says, How is it that you do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread? that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And in the Gospel of Luke, this doctrine is described very explicitly as hypocrisy mm -hmm. in Luke 12 and one. And we need to understand why it is Luke 12 and one. In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people in so much that they trod one upon another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And they were such hypocrites and Christ 
got in their grill and spelled this out for them in graphically blunt terms. But they claim to be the keepers of the law. And they were the ones that were inventing their own law and doing away with the true law of God. And this is what the whole oral tradition was that Christ opposed. And ironically, this is the oral tradition that is lifted up by the Messianic and Hebrew root movement. And it's just insanity. But it's hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy to claim to be the most zealous law keeping people on earth when in reality you're establishing your own law and the rabbinic tradition of the um, the the Talmud and the Kabbalah. And this is the rankest hypocrisy there is. And this was the hypocrisy of this doctrine. It didn't have anything to do with really following God's law. Yeah. It was man's uh, leavened interpretation of it. Yeah, and they would even say that 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 law now was super, was superseding the Torah at that point. Yes, yeah, they absolutely said that. I mean, and, I've read that in some rabbinical writings that that's what certain rabbis would would say that yeah. if if it came down to if an issue came down to uh, the Torah. And the Talmud conflicting on the same topic, they went with the Talmud. Yeah. The oral teachings. Yeah. And rabbinic Judaism still says that. Yeah. They absolutely say that. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people don't realize that Judaism isn't about the Bible. It's about the Talmudic teaching yeah. of Talmud, Kabbalah, and Mishnah. Pick yeah. one, you know. It's not the Torah. No. Acts 23 and 8. The leaven of the Sadducees. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And the Sadducees did not believe in the supernatural. And this is a big, big leaven. We have to believe in the power of God. We have to believe if we don't believe in the spiritual world, the good as well as the bad, you're in, you're in a heap of trouble. Yeah. In a heap of trouble. That's just the way it is. And this is the leaven of the, the Sadducees. They did not believe in these things. Um, Mark eight fifteen, and we're coming into the time where we've got to hammer that leaven completely out of people's brains, and we have to bring them to the place where they believe in the power of God and um, in, in the supernatural power of God. Now, another big one, and oh boy, I mean, all of these are huge, Yeah. but in Mark chapter 8 and verse 15, there's the leaven of Herod. And he charged them saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. The Pharisees always get in there. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Pharisees and Herod, the Pharisees are the big guys there. But the leaven of Herod and in Mark chapter three and verse six, we hear about a group of people that should be talked about a lot more, the Herodians in Mark three and six and the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. And the Herodians were people that as their name would imply, they were supporters of the emperor Herod. And there was a political aspect of their message and they were for religion, but the religion was to support Herod. Now there's plenty of that around today. There's a, there's a right wing um, movement that is very much in the NAR 
um, we read this prophecy of Kurt Landry. That is the messianic leader in the NAR about the, the Evansville prophecy, how that it's going to become Mr. Trump. It's going to be governmental revival meetings. And you see, thank God for everything good that Mr. Trump does. Thank God for um, what he says about pro-life. But there's many things he says which we could enumerate his um, what he says about homosexuality and other things. It's not godly and it's not right. And we've got to have a little bit more than just Republican Party repentance. And whenever you take your faith and you attach it to a political movement, this is the leaven of Herod. It's using religion for a political agenda. And this is leaven. And it will totally corrupt everything you're doing. And um, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So maybe churches being 501c3s, is that kind of being joined up with the government? Oh yeah. Is that is that kind of what you're talking about? That's exactly. I'm talking about any time you think there's a a political solution instead of a Jesus solution, you're jacked up. And you have the five oh one C three. And a lot of people don't really understand what that is, but uh this is just a government corporation. And you sign the papers, and we're not a 501c3, never will be. And when you're a 501c3, you're a government corporation. And you agree not to go against what the government dictates. Hmm. You have signed a yellow dog contract, and you have muzzled yourself. And what you have done, you've made the government your head. Legally, with a written contract. If the government's your head, can you have the government as your head and Jesus at the same time? Uh, that I sounds mean, like the doctrine of the Herodians. That's exactly <laughs> what it is, Jimmy. And this is a huge leaven. I mean, this manifests in all kinds of directions, and it's a huge deception. And you can feel so zealous and so right. I remember back... Um, in the 80s and the 90s, the moral majority with Jerry Falwell and almost everything they said we would agree with. But you cannot use uh, the leaven of the Rodians. You just can't. And if believers, um, Christians, when we are born again, and I'm not against a Christian voting, whether you do or not, um, I don't believe that, uh, I probably am not going to be able to vote this time. That's just me. And that's for people to decide. I'm not going to rail on you if you vote, but here's the deal. If you're a born again, child of God, you cannot vote for a party, the democratic party that says they're going to do everything they can to murder unborn children. Can't, you can't do that. Can't do it. Say you can, I'll say you're a liar. Because if you say you know him and don't keep his commandments, you're a liar. And you cannot promote murdering children if you're a child of God. So, And I can understand why people would vote for President Trump, a believer. And if you do, that's fine. That's between you and God. But there's so many things there I see that I'm probably just going to leave this all in God's hands this time. That's the way I'm going to have to do it. I don't know. I'll, I'll just have to see. But uh, you cannot work. The building the kingdom of God is about bringing people to Christ for building the kingdom of God. It's not about being, bringing people to Christ to build the Republican Party. That's not what it's all about. And there's the same thing, and I could talk about this in different directions, but I think we've made our point to understand, and just like you say, the 501c3, the leaven of Herod. You, you're, it's the mingling in of the 
it's the polluting of the true intent and purpose of the gospel into these other areas. Well, it's like how we were talking earlier about the freedom that comes from not being under something. And it's the same thing with this. Uh, when, when a church comes under a 501c3, like you said, they become under the head of the gov- the government's the head. So you don't have the freedom anymore to speak the complete truth. You can't talk about, uh, without, I mean, some, some people still will talk about political things, but it's at their own risk. If, if the government finds out they're saying something that's against something that the government wants to do, uh, you know, then they could get that yanked away from them, you know, but most of them, they just won't, they don't have that freedom to, to speak the complete truth. Yeah. And, uh, and it'll come to that. There was a, and I think the situation was in Houston during the flooding they had down there. Yeah. And there were some churches that were criticizing the mayor and the mayor, it was a female mayor, a mayoress, I guess. And she was threatening to, uh, have them investigated in the, their 501 C threes pulled and all this. And she pulled the 501 C three card on them because they were criticizing the government. Now, just because this isn't being enforced widely now, it's there, it's law and they can do it whenever they want. And yep. you just watch the shoe fall one of these days. Cause it will judgment yep. will begin at the house of God and their own compromise will be the means of their own judgment. Yep. It absolutely will. Mm. First Corinthians chapter five. Let's look at the leaven of Corinth in first Corinthians chapter five. It says it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife and ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. And it's just down a few verses where we, we read this text earlier in uh, verse seven, Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. The context of this in 1 Corinthians 5 is they had a man in sin. He was having relations with his father's wife. They knew it, and they wouldn't do anything about it. Well, he must have been their biggest donor. I bet he was. I bet he was a Freemason. And I bet probably the the chief of police or something, you know? And you see... There was a situation that we had here in Evansville and the biggest church in Evansville. And we were ministering to a lady that went to that church and her husband was a millionaire, owned several businesses here in Evansville and went through a divorce. And it was a horror story. The abuse, the infidelity, all the boxes were checked And she had gone to her pastor and told her the whole thing, crying her eyes out, pouring her heart out. He left her. And what this pastor said, it probably would be the best since your husband is an elder in our church. If you would find yourself another place to go to church. Wow. That sounds that, like a pastor I mean, that, and that that really happened, Jimmy. Wow. And that happens all the time. Uh, and you see, we all sin, yeah. but if we sin, we need to repent. And you see, if I know that you've gone off the rails, I don't throw you under the bus for going off the rails, but I say, Hey, you got to repent or we're going to have to throw you under the bus. Yeah. You see, that's it. We're, we're human. We can mess up, but well, as someone that's over an assembly, you know, we, we've got to correct it. Yeah. We've got to repent 
and we've got to correct it. And if not, you cannot be a part of the body. The, the leaven has to be put out. We cannot blatantly persist in, re, in willful sin without being dealt with. And this is church discipline is almost non-existent. I mean, this is another leaven we could talk about over and over and over. Um, Freemasons are readily accepted. I know some of the biggest churches in Evansville that have homosexual worship leaders. And you can see this on the national stage yeah, now. It's accepted. One. You know, I can't, uh, you know, if I would um, judge my homosexual worship leaders, I wouldn't have love, man. Uh, it's what Brian Houston, the Hillsong yeah. said. So, you know, that's where we're at. This is leaven. And this is another huge reason why it's all gone bad. It's all gone bad. Mm. Um, well, let's look at the. Well, what do you call what do you call this leaven number four? The leaven of Corinth, I would call it, and that leaven of Corinth is no church discipline and allowing. You see, and when we allow that to go on, it obviously corrupts and leavens the whole lump. Yeah. 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 And, it, you know, it doesn't do no good to sing there's power in the blood if we got someone that everybody knows is laying up with someone else's wife, you know. And that's obviously true, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that ain't, well, maybe that's true. That's obviously true. And it's obvious that that leaven is everywhere. Yeah. I mean, that leaven is just everywhere. The leaven of Corinth hath come to America. Let's look at the fifth leaven, the leaven of Galatia. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, let's begin in verse 4. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, year fallen by grace. There is no justification through keeping law. Justification is by grace through faith. We've talked a lot about the purpose of the law. Romans 3.20, for by law is the knowledge of sin. The law is very real, but it doesn't justify you keeping the law. It must be by grace through faith. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Because we love God and we have faith, we work. Faith that worketh by love. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you? that ye should not obey the truth. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. The leaven of Galatia is works righteousness. This is basically the righteousness of Roman Catholicism, which is millions of people in well, Roman it's also part of the JW thing because they, they keep track of all their hours that they minister and they go out and on, on Saturdays and they, they, they call it, they go out in service, but yet they keep, and then they have, they have levels. Uh, you're called a pioneer if you put 10 hours in a week. And if you <laughs> want to get a, uh, to be, uh, whatever the biggest name is, that's like full-time job on top of your full-time job. So that's very works-based. Yeah. So. And there are a lot of churches that teach justification by faith, but they teach sanctification by works. Hmm. Well, how do you overcome sin? Well, you're there every time the doors open. Mm-hmm. You're faithful. Find someone to be accountable to. Uh, do this, do that. It's always do something, and you can't do anything 
to whip your sin problem, but die to it by faith in the cross. So they're teaching, and they won't say, well, we're teaching sanctification by works, but they are. Because bless their hearts, they don't know the right. answer to the sin problem. Right. Uh, it's justification by faith, and it's also sanctification by faith. And then we, through love, we obey God's law. And these are very simple premises, but the devil is so good at getting people out of balance on these basic fundamental things. And uh, the works righteousness thing, I mean, this leaven, all of these leavens have just exploded. All five of them have exploded everywhere. And this is why it's all gone bad, man. It's all gone bad. Till the whole is leavened. Now I'm going to blow your mind here. Oh, no. As, as we quit here, I'm going to blow everybody's mind. Let's go to Leviticus 23. Now, there was one time under the Levitical system when leaven was acceptable. Mm. And I want us to think about this, why it was. And uh, there's a profound revelation here also. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 23. In Leviticus chapter 23, let's begin with verse 15. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheave of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Ye shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenth deals. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Now, this is talking about the Feast of Pentecost. Now, why is it that here on the Feast of Pentecost, God says, put a little leaven in it? Now, here's the real deal. And, of course, the Feast of Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit was poured out. Right, right after Jesus uh, ascended. Yeah. And on the Feast of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, he came in to some of the most devout, consecrated believers that ever existed. Peter, James, and John, uh, the early disciples that were set apart. But the thing about every one of them, they all had sin in them. Even the most holy, even Peter and James and John, they all had that sinful nature. They all had leaven. So now, on the Feast of Pentecost, it was okay for the Spirit of God to come in to that leaven. Because God gives us this treasure in earthen vessels. And while sin remains, it will not reign. So this is in itself another beautiful, beautiful picture wow. of what God does in fallen man to bring about his pure kingdom. Because even though we're fallen, if we keep our eyes on Christ and point totally to him and not to us, the Holy Spirit can come into us leaven vessels and bring forth a pure kingdom for the master. Thank you for watching this episode of The Doctrine of Christ. We pray it provided you with clarity and understanding. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Hit the notification bell so you never miss an episode. Follow us on Facebook. Leave a comment. Ask a question. You can also email us comments and questions now at thedoctrineofchristseries at gmail.com. And until next time, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with you all.